The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Howdy, Clappy fans, and welcome to Copy for Clappy. June, and years have gone. My, how fast it goes. Hey, um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. We'd love to see all these names and some new people on the list today, as well as some old-timers. So thanks, everybody, for uh, taking the time to join us today. And we're delighted to have Jody on board today. Um, Jody Pound for Pound is probably one of the best uh, hydronic gurus in the industry. He's got a, a deep knowledge of specifically in the boiler industry. So uh, we got the right guy in the right place, and you're here at the right time. So um, Jody, also, I think you have hydronic in your own house. So he uh, talks the talk and walks the walk. So um, hydronics. So we're up to issue number 18. Number 19 will be out here within the next couple months. These are probably one of the best training uh, resources in the industry. We're very proud of this, and this is uh, a, a free for you. So just let us know if you're not getting these. Go to our website and sign up, and uh, these will be mailed right to your doorstep. And uh, Jody will show you the issues that kind of relate to the topic today here in the next slide. But uh, make sure you have these, and if you need some back issues or something, let us know. Um, so I'm, in fact, I'm going to turn it over to Jody. He's, he's the guy. Tell us what you got here. Now, I've been a boiler guy for a while. And um, I work for, you know, on the, the residential side, particularly when we start to look at the condensing boilers coming into the market. I have to say I go back about 10 or 11 years, and one of the questions that still comes up, sometimes from homeowners, sometimes from contractors, is all about upgrading an existing system. We call it the iron out. Yeah. It's about iron boilers, cast iron. It's about copper fin boilers. It's about steel boilers. Can I take my existing heating system and just swap the boiler out and see good, comfortable performance? And equally as important, can I save money in the process? And so that's always the two sides of the, the coin that everybody's looking for, comfort and savings. Now, when somebody poses me this question, I'm very evasive in my answers. To somebody, usually the conversation finally turns to, how much am I going to save? How much money can I save on the, the conversion? My first answer is a very definite, it depends. It depends a lot on a number of factors. Am I doing a commercial building? Am I doing a residential building? Tell me all about the building itself. You know, if somebody's pressing me hard for a number, my second answer, and this is particularly on the residential side, commercial is a little bit more complicated. But my answer, and I consider this a fairly comfortable answer, is if it's done right, I should save you at least 25% on your fuel bills. And to me, that's a good number to run with. Could it be more? Absolutely. Now, first thing that comes out is, well, how do I get to 25 or greater? When I did, when I had a boiler conversion done in my house, and my wife pressed me for the number, I told her 35. We're going to talk a little bit about how that number haunted me um, after the first year of heating. But somebody says, how do I get to that number? I mean, you're putting in a boiler that has an AFUE of 90%. My current boiler is 80% efficient. Where's the 25 coming from? That's 15. Now, first thing we're going to realize when we start is it's based on the baseline. 100% isn't the baseline. The baseline is the equipment that's sitting inside the building. So if it's 80% efficient, it's about how much more efficient 95 becomes. So it's not about a baseline of 15 or I'm starting with 15. I'm really starting at a, I'll, I'll round up. I'll call it 19%. So if I go from 80% to 95%, that should be about a 19% savings. Then the question becomes, well, where's the rest of the savings coming from? Okay. And you'll find that this, these, these words come out many a time during the course of this. Do your homework. When I look at doing a conversion from a non-condensing to a condensing boiler, it's not as simple as walk into the mechanical room, look at the boiler, spend five minutes, walk out, and write up a quote. There's homework that has to happen. Okay? What's your baseline of the boiler? What do I have in the mechanical room? What's surrounding it? Let's do our homework. Am I comparing the boiler to a lab test? an AFUE, a thermal efficiency? Am I comparing it to a combustion test or am I comparing it to a field combustion analysis? Typically, particularly on the commercial side and particularly on the oil side, 
my my number of com comparing to usually not a lab number. If somebody that went into the mechanical room, they took a combustion analyzer and they ran a combustion test on the boiler. Here's a great example of one. This happens to be for an atmospheric boiler. And among the information is the efficiency and losses. So this boiler, according to this combustion test, is 79.5% efficient. So all of a sudden, I'm looking at the competition, and that's where it starts. Now, many will say numbers never lie. That number doesn't lie when you're looking at the, combust the efficiency of the gases passing through the boilers, but there's a lot of backstory here that we need to take a look at. I'm going to jump up to this number up here, this T room. The combustion analyzers measure a lot of things, and one of the things is the room temperature. This room temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Could it be done, could the test have been done on a July day? Absolutely. But for the, those of us that have spent time in boiler rooms, particularly in the middle of the heating season, the expectation isn't that we walk into the boiler room and we leave our jacket on. The expectation is I walk into that boiler room, it's 80, it's 85, maybe 90 degrees. Where does that heat come from? Well, you look around that boiler room, there's probably not a heater in the room, and if it is, it's probably turned off. All of that heat's coming off of the boiler. Okay. Now, if that boiler is putting up enough, enough heat to bring that room up to 80, 85, 90 degrees, that's losses that this combustion analysis doesn't even consider. Now, let's look at another thing on here. It's called lambda. Now, everybody say, what's, what's lambda? Somebody probably will say, you know what? I saw Revenge of the Nerds. I know it is a Greek letter. Okay? It represents a lot of things. And from our aspect, lambda is an indication of excess air. So I expect a one-point-something number. If I had a 1.0, I wouldn't have any excess air. The numbers after the decimal point represent your excess air. The 1.88 indicates that I am passing 80% more air through the system than I need for combustion. Okay. Where's that air coming from? Well, if this is an atmospheric boiler, my expectation is it draws the air out of the boiler room, and then makeup air comes in there to replace that air that's being dragged out. So I got 88% excess air. My boiler is is giving off enough heat to maintain 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the boiler room. Then the question becomes how much losses does this represent? You know, people will argue about a lot of different numbers, but I say if I'm looking at that, that's probably at least four, maybe five percent of the energy that that boiler is generating is never making it out of the boiler room, but it's not reflected anywhere. So when I start to look at where the savings are, it's based on the rating of the boiler, it's based on combustion, but there's a lot of other things that happen that I can pick up along the way. This happens to be one of them. Now, let's take a further look at this number here, okay? Numbers never lie but they reflect the conditions under which they're generated. I do an AFUE test. I do a thermal efficiency test. It's under lab conditions. Everything is delineated on how that boiler is going to be tested. I go into a mechanical room and I do a combustion test. It's up to me. When do I start it? When do I finish it? My first question when somebody shows me a combustion test, my first question is, how much the water? What's your water temperature? If the water temperature in the boiler is 120 degrees, I get much better heat transfer than the water temperature being 180 degrees. So what will happen is, if they don't allow the temperature system to come up to temperature, they get an artificially high combustion efficiency. Um, a friend of mine that I had, had uh, worked with in the past, a gentleman named J.P. Rivet, you know, called him up, great boiler guy, and I was trying to nail him down on how much of a change that is. After a longer conversation, I'm kind of going with the, the lower end number. And the lower end number that we pretty much agreed on is if I test the boiler at 120 degrees, the efficiency actually will drop by 3%, possibly more when it gets up to 180. So all of a sudden, I'm using this number as the yardstick, 
but it's artificially high because of the conditions the boiler's tested under. Now, the other one that comes into place really is heading into the oil industry. Yeah. I go into a, a residential or a commercial application. I expect to walk in there and find a, a stack of, of uh, heavy paper, almost like a cardboard card, wire tied to a pipe with this display, this printout stapled to it. Sometimes you see 20 years worth showing how that boiler performed. Now, that typically is done after the boiler is clean. You know, my question always becomes, well, what was it before? You know, nobody does it before because nobody wants to clean a hot boiler. So um, when I look at that, the soot buildup, soot is a great insulator, and it can have a big effect on um, the, the heat transfer. This is a great chart out there. It looks at the effects of soot and scale on heat transfer. I'm going to go with a thin layer, one sixteenth of an inch. If I have a sixteenth of an inch of soot, my law, that boiler efficiency is off by 27.9. It's that heavy of an insulator on the inside. So that boiler that may be 80% after it's clean, before it's cleaned, its efficiency was almost 30% less. So when you look at the annual performance of that boiler, it's not at the high end, it's not at the low end, it's somewhere in the middle. But the, the combustion analyzer really doesn't give you a good picture of what we're up against when we're trying to figure out the saving that's going to occur. Now, residentially, if, um, if somebody has an atmospheric gas boiler, a cast iron residential uh, boiler that's fired with natural gas, atmospheric, a lot of times, they may not take a combustion analyzer and check the combustion when they look at replacing it. They'll go to the knee plate, get the data off, and use that as a baseline. Okay. If that boiler has been in there for 20 years, there's no idea how much soot may be on the inside of it. You know, because there's a good possibility with gas that it hasn't been cleaned in a long while, if ever. And on the water side, there's a good chance that the, there's a scale built up on the inside as well. You know, I couple these together, and sometimes these boilers are running 15, 20, 25, possibly more percent under the advertised performance. It's an opportunity for savings, but a lot of times it's a hidden opportunity. Um, the one thing with, you know, talking about savings with potential customers, I always would rather be conservative under promise and over deliver rather than the opposite. Now, later on, we're going to talk a little about the, the IBR numbers when it comes to select the boiler. You know, each boiler will come with a series of ratings on it. Some of the ratings are here as an example. Um, you know, I pulled this out of Lock and Bar, one of Lock and Bar manuals. You know, I like their manuals. They have a lot of stuff, always have good pictures and a lot of information. But each boiler comes with a number of ratings. The one I'm interested in, or the piece I'm, wanting, I'm interested in, is that piece that's off of the bottom. The boiler has an, a net IDR rating. I think nowadays they call it the net AHRI. You know, I happen to be old school. I still believe in the IBR. But this IBR rating is the output of the boiler derated for 15%. And part of that 15% is an 8% derate for distribution losses. The, the expectation is the water leaves the boiler, and between the boiler and the heat emitter, there's going to be, lo there's going to be a loss. We size based on about 8% loss along the way. When I go in, I start to retrofit. One of the things I have to consider is I can, I can start to get rid of some of this loss. It's about pipe loss. This happens to be out of one of my hydronics. And let's look at the, the bare copper tubing. Let me blow up that picture of the tubing. So the chart is based on the difference in the water temperature in the pipe versus the air temperature outside. Okay. So if I look at that and I start to operate, I can say, okay, my water temperature is 160 degrees. The air temperature around it is 100 degrees, excuse me, 60 degrees. That gives me 100 degrees out the tip. I can go off onto the chart of that figure 7-1A, and with that information, I, can, I will find that the pipe will lose 45 BTUs per linear foot every hour. Now, I couple that, let's say I have 100 feet of exposed copper tubing in my system. 
that 100 feet of three-quarter inch copper tubing every hour losing 4,500 BTUs. I bring in the condensing boiler. I run it off of outdoor reset. I reduce my water temperatures. There's going to be times in operation where the boiler is only running at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So 100 degrees Fahrenheit minus 60 Fahrenheit gives me a 40 degree delta T. With that 40 degree delta T, my 45 BTUs per linear foot drops down to 18. I've reduced the heat, the distribution losses by more than half. So when I start to look at saving energy, it's not just about what's happening in the boiler, it's what's happening in the entire system. I'm in there working on the boiler. Let's consider insulating. Standard half inch rubber insulation. Okay. Let's say I'm still looking at that 100 degree difference where I'm looking at 18 BTUs per foot. I take that same pipe, that same water conditions, I insulate it. I'm now at the six BTUs per foot. I significantly reduced my losses from the piping, and that is shown as increasing the efficiency on not just the, the system. Questions, though. Mark, any, any, any questions at this point? No, Jody, we're good. Excellent. Okay. Now, when I look at a project, there's two sides. And with, particularly with a commercial project, hopefully the two sides are talking. The side that pays for the project once, pays for the bills once the project is implemented, and they see the ongoing bills on the life cycle of the system. The flip side becomes, Who's paying for the project up front? The upfront cost. You can make a very good case for the, the back end of it, but when it really comes down to somebody has to write a check, and usually when it comes time to write a check, the question becomes, why is this more? Is there a way to bring that cost down? Is this a true comparison? Okay. The first thing with high efficiency equipment is most of the times, there's going to be some sort of incentive out there from the gas company. This happens to be my local utility in Rhode Island, National Grid. Okay? This is a listing of their incentive programs for high efficiency. So I'm going to draw up on the bottom here, condensing boilers. Wide variety of incentives based on efficiency and also based on the size of the, size of the boiler. Okay? Most manufacturers shoot for a 95 AFUE annual fuel utilization efficiency for their boiler. That's because 95 usually is the yardstick for the biggest incentive on the residential side. So if I can get, if I, can get, if I put in a 95 AFUE boiler, I'm getting $1,500 back from um, my utility. If the, if the installation really has been presented to the building owner about going non-condensing versus condensing, there's an upcharge to move to a condensing boiler. You know, residentially, uh, that $1,500, depending on which boiler manufacturer's boiler you're going with, that can do a lot to take a big chunk out of that upcharge to move to that condensing boiler. In fact, with some manufacturers, that $1,500 may almost erase the upcharge of going from condensing to non-condensing. So there is a way to help bring that cost down. Now, in the competitive of the condensing versus non-condensing, a couple other things have to come into to play. So I'm going in there with the, recommending to do a condensing boiler. Somebody else is going in saying, you know what, let's go non-condensing. And they, they probably have tried to make a good case with uh, the building owner and came in with a, a very good uh, quote on the job. Now, the minute somebody says, I'm trying to replace a condensing, a non-condensing boiler, and the existing system is 20, 25, 30 years old, my first question always is, will the current venting do? I am changing out like for like in that they're both non-condensing, but the problem is, as I increase the efficiency, 
I go from 75% efficiency to 80% efficiency. Or in the case of oil and AFUE, let's call it 87 and a half. All of a sudden, the amount of energy that's in that flue gas, it still, hopefully it will still stay, the, the, the late heat will still stay as a vapor, but all of a sudden, drafting in the draft of the chimney and making sure that chimney has no condensing on it all of a sudden becomes an issue. If you look at most boiler manufacturers, when you get to the higher efficiency boilers, most manufacturers are re recommending a chimney liner. In fact, if you look at some of the governing documents, uh, NFPA 54 for gas, uh, NFPA 31 deals with oil fired equipment, uh, NFPA 211 deals with venting, I start to look through these manuals and I look at their size and fit tables, most of this is driving towards lining the chimney, possibly insulating it. All of a sudden, when the, the chimney liner, the cost of material, the cost of insulation come into play, the price difference between condensing and non-condensing starts to collapse. Okay. The other thing that comes into play that has to be discussed when we're looking at trying what, what's the level playing field between condensing and non-condensing, it's about makeup air. A building goes up. Let's say it went up 20 years ago. The boiler's in the basement of the building. The basement's 24 feet by 36 feet with 10-foot ceilings. Okay. The boiler is drawing air out of there. If I calculate the volume, I calculate the volume. The volume of that unfinished basement is 8,640 cubic feet. Okay. Why is that important? Okay. Here's a little piece on air from combustion and ventilation. Uh, I pulled that out of a manual, out of a, a peerless boiler manu manual. And I wanted to look at the requirements for combustion air, and I wanted to jump down to the standard method. The minimum required volume for indoor shall be 50 cubic feet per 1,000 BTUs per hour. So if I have 8,640 cubic feet of space, I can go all the way up to a 172,800 BTU boiler and not have to worry about makeup air. So the boiler goes in, it passes final inspection, everything is good. Now let's flash forward 20 years. The basement has been finished. It's been subdivided. There's a laundry room. There's a man cave. There's a playroom. There's a storage space. The boiler now has been walled off so that it's a five by five room with 10 foot ceilings. I go through and I do my calculation. The room now has 250 cubic feet. I can support a 5,000 BTU boiler, but let's say it has a 120,000 BTU boiler in there. It's not good for combustion and it doesn't meet code. So I go in there and I'm going to pull the permit. I'm going to replace the boiler and there's going to be a final inspection. The final inspection is going to come around and they're going to say, well, you didn't pass. You have to consider makeup there. And it's because of the limited volume, particularly if the basement's subdivided, there's no way to make sure the air flows freely to support that combustion. So what happens? Everybody's little friend from field control comes into play. I've seen many of these in basements around New England. One of my sisters uh, had this in the basement. Field control makes it. It's called a fan in the can. Okay? It's a fan designed to draw combustion air into the room. I put it into the boiler room. I pipe it to the outside. I then have to wire it into the system. I don't want this running 24 hours a day. I want it to come on when the boiler fires. But not only do I want it to come on when the boiler fires, I want its proving switch to make sure it's bringing in air before the boiler fires. So all of a sudden, more equipment, more labor, more, more complexity. When I start to throw stuff like this into the picture, and I start to compare it to the condensing boiler, most of the condensing boilers have a sealed combustion option. I'd say probably the most popular is this one up here in the left-hand corner. Two pipe horizontal. Doing a 100,000 B2 boiler, I can probably do that in two inch. The vent pipe, I would probably do it as two inch polypropylene. You know, a central therm, a duravent, something like that. To vent the boiler out, the intake pipe, I would do it with PVC. 
it's up, it's out, it's finished, and I don't have to worry about the existing chimney. And it also is a relatively low-cost alternative from the aspect of materials and labor. But all of a sudden, I start to add all of this stuff together, and all of a sudden, the condensing boiler becomes a much better alternative than just doing a simple boiler swap out. Because, you know, we all know a simple boiler swap out never repeats. Okay? So, the decision is made. We're going with a condensing boiler. Now comes the time to do more homework. It's about doing the homework to make sure everything goes right. What size boiler? That's really the first question I have to answer is, what size boiler do I need? Okay. Most guys will go down and check the rating plate on the boiler. My recommendation is if you're reading the rating plate, forget about it the minute you walk out of there. Okay. The rating plate really is not going to tell you what you're looking for. A couple of reasons why. And all these reasons really tie back to the boiler is probably oversized for the application. If I'm in the part of the world where tankless coils are a big part of uh, the water heating business. The boiler typically is not sized for heating. It's sized for domestic hot water delivery. You know, I'll walk into a lot of houses, 60, 70,000 BTUs after a heat load. The boiler's in that neighborhood of about 150,000 BTUs. They want three, three and a half GPM of flow rate. So I have to look at that, know what it's doing, and then realize I have to look elsewhere for the information because I know that boiler's going to be oversized because of the application it's sized for. Yeah. A lower heat load building was the building size based on the boiler that was available at the lower firing rate with that style of boiler. If I'm doing oil, was the firing rate of the boiler really set by the lowest nozzle size that the, the contractor was sure is not going to give them problems? You know, worry about dirty oil, worry about the nozzle getting plugged. Well, you know what, let's do a 0.75, a 0.65 maybe. That way there, I'm sure that I'm not going to have to have come back and clean the filter and you know, replace the nozzle on, on too regular a basis. You know, ideally, I'd like to do it about once a year. Okay. Was this the original boiler? Yeah. When boilers get swapped out, unless they're going brand for brand, there's usually some variation in the size. Particularly if this is an emergency swap out. I have a customer, their heat is down, it's in the middle of the heating system, season their coals. I go to my wholesaler, I say, I need a boiler. I need it at this size, I need 80,000 BTUs. The response comes back, well, I don't have it in 80,000, but I got 115. You know, I'm looking to provide heat for that customer, I'm going to go with the 115. Okay. The other thing that comes into play is the building itself. Was the building envelope improved? It may be that the boiler was pretty close in size based on the original building with single pane windows, very little insulation, but all of a sudden the building envelope starts to improve. The boiler becomes more and more oversized. So when I start to look at sizing my boiler, I have to look elsewhere than the boiler itself. Okay. Really, the place to look for right sizing, let's talk about a heat loss calculation. In fact, in a lot of municipalities, the heat loss calculation is required in the permitting part of the, the, um, the job itself. Uh, I, uh, this is a great place for information. Green Building Advisor had to put it up because it is the musings of an energy nerd, and it's how to perform a heat, heat loss calculation. Now, when I do heat losses, I can go old school. Some of the guys still do it. The long hand sheet. This is from the old IBR days. More often than not, now it's all done computerized. This happens to be right off. This is one that I've worked with in the past. But it's an easy drawing program to go in there and build the building. That way there, you know when you're finished, you have a good idea of what the, the heat loss on the building is. And sometimes it can be quite, uh, quite eye-opening. Uh, when it came time for the boiler swap in my house, I had an atmospheric gas-fired boiler, and it was in the neighborhood of about 90,000 BTUs. 
I ran my house on rice off. I couldn't get more than 40000 every way I, I wrote it. So that boiler in my house was over 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 100% oversized, and there was a gas-fired water heater, so it wasn't sized to, to support the indirect either. So let's go through, let's do a heat loss, get a, a BTU per hour under the design conditions to heat that building, and then let's work from there. Now, along with the boiler, in a lot of instances, an indirect water heater also has to be supported by that boiler itself. Okay? And I can pull this one up, the Superstore Ultra. It's one that I've seen quite a bit in the, the New England market. And I've, uh, when I work for a rep firm, I'd often design a system from somebody. I'd size the boiler. i tell them, you need an 85,000 BTU boiler. And they'd say, no, I need 175,000. And I'm like, what's that based on? And they're like, he transfer tells me I need 175000 because I'm using this water heater. Okay. Now, this, this number, is this input is designed on meeting the hot water commands that are listed here. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, I'm looking at putting in a boiler that's two or maybe even three times larger than the heat load of the building. You know, my question always comes up, particularly if they gave me the plans to help design. I look at the plans, and I, my question always is, this is a three-bedroom house with two baths, and I'm betting you're doing low flow shower heads. Are they really going to go through 370 gallons of hot water first hour rating? Let's take a look at their hot water use, and let's build around that. Because from my aspect, this is a little friend of mine. Uh, owned by a, one of our, a friend of a friend, but uh, really, does the, the tail wag the dog or vice versa? Do we want to look at the, the higher of the two loads, the constant of the two loads, or the momentary load? A lot of manufacturers have charts like these. I happen to pull one from Antrol and one from Wiesman. Uh, the Wiesman you probably can't read. It has a lot of detail on it, but it also has a lot of information. But let's take a look at that, that boiler main chart. Yeah. If I can go in and I, I can figure out that the homeowner, let's say they need, or the building owner, needs 100 gallons first hour rating on a boiler, and let's say I'm going with a WH41, 100 gallons per first hour is right here. It's less than 116. I only need a 60,000 BTU boiler to meet the needs of that water heater. So when I start to look at water heater and sizing, I, know I should look at the application to ensure that I know what the requirements are rather than just going and trying to maximize the performance of the indirect water heater. You know, if I maximize the performance, there's a good chance that my modulating boiler never leaves low fire. I want to be able to maximize its modulation range. Now, I will also tell you that particularly when I get to the commercial side of things, a health club, a hotel, a motel, something that I may see long stretches, an apartment building, long stretches of hot water where I need the extra capacity, then I have to start looking at adding energy, adding additional BTUs to my boiler side to make sure that I meet the requirements of that building. But I'd say that's more on the commercial side of things rather than your standard residential type application. So, boiler has three ratings on the plate. The boiler input, the gross DOE, CSA output, the net IBR. Which one do I choose? The gross output, that's the amount of energy that's available at the backside of the boiler. Pretty much it's run by you know, a, a, st a steady state test. The net IBR, that's 15% less than the gross uh, DOE based on having enough energy for what's called the piping and pickup loss. Normally, I'm going to jump down to the net IBR. It's the safe number. It makes sure I'm covered for the application. You know, I want to make sure that if there's any losses off the piping, I have, have the energy available. Now, if the boiler is running off of outdoor reset and they're doing a good job of selection of the heating curve. 
and I know my piping is insulated, I pretty much removed the need for the gross the, uh, the extra 15%. Uh, personally, I have sized a number of boilers where I've sized them off of the gross DOE, but it, it has always been a bad of doing my homework to make sure that I'm making that right selection. And the thing is, by doing this, sometimes it may drop down the boiler size. If I can drop down the boiler size, there's a cost savings associated with it that may make the condensing boiler choice a little bit more um, attractive to the building owner. Let's not leave performance to chance. While I'm in the building, let's measure the amount of heat emitter in the building. So go around, measure the amount of baseboard. Why is it? Typically when somebody thinks of baseboard or when somebody has sized baseboard, it's probably was based on about 600 BTUs per linear foot at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. I go through, I do a heat load in the building. Let's call the heat load 40,000 BTUs. I measure the baseboard. I end up with 100 feet of baseboard. There's an opportunity to drop the water temperature. So here's the typical baseboard ratings. You know, somebody looks at the number, they're like, oh, you got that from Clanton. Great information on the website. I always try and use, you know, stuff that's clear and to the point. So let's say I have 40,000 BTUs. Let's say I have 100 feet of baseboard. I do the math. I need the baseboard to produce about 400 BTUs per linear foot. So I go up to my chart. Let's say I'm looking at the 4 GPM range. Add 150 Fahrenheit, there's my 400 BTUs per linear foot. Since I want to average that, I want to supply at 160, I want to return at 140 on the design day. That gives me my 150 degrees Fahrenheit. It, you know, if everything is done right, the house is comfortable, and the heating system is running at its most efficient point. Now, when I start to look at the installation, I start to look at the boiler swap out. Is the boiler swap out just about swapping out the boiler, or is there more? You know, I start taking stuff apart. There's clear indication that there's corrosion throughout the system. So when I start to look at boiler removal, boiler replacement, it's about replacing other things in the system. Okay. My goal when I look at design, I'm not trying to design for the short term. I'm trying to design for the long term, 20 to 25 years. If, if, an, if a company, if a utility is incentivizing a project, a lot of times that's based on an anticipated savings over a 25 year period, 20 year period. So let's get there. Let's address air separation. Let's address dirt separation. Let's address magnetic separation. And I like the magnetic separation because over a 20 to 25 year life cycle, there's a lot of iron-based particles that are going to build up through the system. I want to magnetically separate them out. It's also about water quality. Lime scale formation in the boiler. Lime scale reduces the efficiency and potentially reduces the life of the boiler itself. So it's something that I want to take a look at to address. One of the things that often comes up is well, what does my boiler manufacturer say about it? So uh, here's some statements that I pulled out of installation manuals for different manufacturers. If you look at their warranties, the warranties usually will say a caveat about water quality and reference the installation manual. You know, if I look at here, I have a, a 5 and 8.77 and then three sevens. Um, if you're wondering who these are, there is a peerless boiler, there is an IPC, there is a lock and bar, there is a triangle tube, there is a easement. And so these are the ones that I have information here. And if you look at all of those numbers, they're down in that seven grain area, which from a water quality standpoint, isn't that hard of a water. So when we start to look at the boiler replacement, not only do we have to think about the boiler, but the water is a vital part of the system as well that has to be addressed. So what stays and goes? I look at the existing boiler room, definitely the boiler. I have a circulator on the return. It might be 15, 20 years old. That's going to go as well. An air purger with a vent, an expansion tank, 
a fill valve, a backflow preventer, all those items tend to be something that somebody wants to get rid of. Now, over the years, as I've worked with different guys, I walk into the mechanical room, and there's a lot more being replaced. And the answer always is, you know what, Jody? I now have ownership of that system. didn't matter whether I touched it or replaced it. I was the last guy in here. So since I have ownership, zone valve goes and zone controls go. You know, so most people, a boiler replacement is actually a mechanical room upgrade, particularly on the residential side. So the replacements in, in the con condensing market, we really have two schools. We have the low water content boiler with a high pressure drop, which requires primary, secondary. And then we have the high water content boiler with the low pressure drop that can go direct connected. So we'll look at each one separately. So with the got low water content and high pressure drop, what am I expecting to replace? Well, it's the boiler. I have to do a boiler circulator because it didn't exist before. I need means of primary secondary connection. I need air separation. It's an old building. I want to see dirt separation. I want that boiler and I want the equipment to last up to 20 years. Let's give it its best chance of, of, of lasting that long. A new fill valve, a new expansion tank, and probably a new system circulator. And there's a good chance that system circulator is going to have an ECM. My electric company in the Northeast rebates that as well. Okay. Something that should be considered is magnetic separation. Let's help protect the ECM pump, but also with the magnetic separation, let's get that in there and make sure we catch all the iron particles before any of this gets back to the boiler or anywhere else that could do problems. Now, to simplify, let's take these, let's take the magnetic, and let's build it all into the SEP4, the Kalefi SEP4 hydraulic separator. It does my primary secondary. It does my air. It does my dirt. It does magnetic. You know, the beauty of it, it brings it all into a single component, and it puts everything in the right location. Now, there's no variation that occurs. It ensures that from a design standpoint, it's going to ensure success of, of the installation. Let's look at a couple of installs. Okay. So here is a, a used to be, it was a Kalefi Excellence. You can actually see the chimney and the boiler from the previous. Off the top of the boiler, you see the two, the flue pipe and the incoming air. So they're going to seal combustion. And then it has all the components we discussed. It has the hydraulic separator doing air and dirt. You know, the boiler pump, the fill valve, uh, the expansion tank, and in fact, they did new zoning throughout uh, the system. Very nice, nice installation. Um, here's another one up in New York. I'm really not going to talk much about this. I want to make sure I stay somewhat on, on time. But uh, something I want to mention that's a little bit different from the previous, if you look at the top of the boiler, they're just venting the boiler out. It looks like a polypropylene material. They must have met the requirements to make up here, so they're doing an, an air, the air coming out of the space itself. If I do multiple boilers, it just means things grow a little bit. A second boiler goes in, a second pump, and then I need to make sure I have it set up for controlling it. But again, when I start to look at these installations, these, these all were jobs that went in that were retrofit, that were uh, submitted to, excuse me, the Kalefi Excellence Program. Now, let's go to a high mass boiler. The need for primary secondary goes away. So it's boiler. It's separate air and it's separate dirt separation. I like to keep them separate on a retrofit job. I want the air separator out where it's most effective pulling the air out of the, the fluid stream, but I also want the dirt separator to protect both the boiler and the pump because my expectation is I drain that system down, I refill it, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's lifted up. I want to make sure I protect everything I can from that system. And like the previous, on the separator, let's consider doing magnetic separation. You know, that, uh, that pump may be driven by an ECM. And the other thing with a large mass boiler, you tend to have very low velocities in there. If anything's carried with the velocity of the water, all of a sudden, I get in there, the water slows down dramatically, and it does start to drop out. Now, if you haven't seen the high water volume, low pressure drop, 
And again, these are just a couple of them. There's a number of manufacturers out there. The Lockenbach Crest is a great example of this. Um, also, the Wiesman Vita, Vita Crossel series of boilers. It shows a 300, but there's also a 200 series boiler. Very low water content, direct connected. How easy is the connection? This happens to be out of the Lockenbach Crest manual, showing the boilers direct connected, um, no primary secondary. Now, since I can't leave stuff alone, that would be my system. Dirt mag on the inside, become more effective than just a wide strainer, and then a highly effective uh, air separator on the outlet. Just a little bit of tweaking that I do if it was up to me. This happens to be an installation. Um, I, I got this off of Beesman's website. I've actually been in this mechanical room myself. It's Fairfax County, uh, Virginia Public School. It was a direct boiler swap. I pulled out the old boilers, repiped in the new boilers, and didn't touch much. But again, it allows them to very quickly, efficiently, and effectively uh, shift over to a non-condensing boiler, excuse me, from a non-condensing boiler to a condensing boiler in the same installation. And finally, on the startup side, don't forget the water. Uh, there's our bog roar with our hydrofill. And what the hydrofill allows you to do is on the job site, take the local water that's available, pass it through the hydrofill, remove all of your dissolved solids, all of your ions, and basically have demineralized water going into your system so that water quality now is not an issue with the performance and the life cycle of, uh, of the heating system. So, the system goes in. Okay. This happens to be the system in my ba the basement of my house. Now, it's been in there, I don't know, probably about six years. And it replaced the cast iron boiler, an atmospheric cast iron boiler, with originally it had a gas fired water heater that prior to Moving to this, I shifted over to an indirect. And my wife had asked me the loaded question. How much are we going to save? And since it was my own house, I went out on the limb and I told her 35%. Okay. And I went through what a lot of people do when the first heating bill came in and my wife walked through the door her first question was, hi, how is work? And then it was followed with, we got the gas bill, I don't see my savings. So the question always becomes, when you start to look at savings, how do you quantify it and clean it up so that it actually represents what's happening? Okay. First, we're going to talk about the discussion, a lot of the discussion points that I had to have with my wife. By the way, she really was wishy. We hadn't started this discussion about 13 seconds into it. So she came in and I'm like, I'm like, she showed me the bill. She's like, we're paying more than I thought. And of course, I being the engineer that I am, I'm like, honey, we don't burn dollars, we burn terms of natural gas. And she's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, the fuel price doesn't stay consistent, it varies. Look at over here, and it happened to have a bar graph on it, and it shows therms with the number per month for the past 13 months. So on my first off, you've got to understand that because of the variation in fuel prices, it's better to look at how much fuel we're using. Okay? Now, if you look at these two graphs, the graph shows that we use less fuel this November than we did last. So you have to normalize the fuel usage, get away from the dollars. And she's like, well, that number really doesn't add up either. And I'm like, well, you ever heard about a degree day? And at that point, she actually walked into the other room, but I kept on talking. Okay. And a degree day really, let's, let's kind of just summarize the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a way to quantify heating needs. And uh, this is, happens to be uh, something that I, uh, I downloaded for uh, Coventry, Rhode Island, my town. And you can see month to month, and I actually highlighted two of the marches. You know, March of last year, we had over 1,000 heating degree days. March of this year, we had under 700 heating degree days. The more heating degrees, the higher the fuel usage is going to be. So when I start to look at trying to quantify, it really becomes down to 
therm, get it down to a therm per heating degree day. That way there, it gives me a much cleaner picture of what the fuel savings is. It can start to take a lot of the variation out of the picture. Okay. Now, the final thing that came up was really about heat loss. Okay. And prior to the boiler, part of the old boiler, when people start are living in a, a situation where they feel that they're paying more for fuel than they want to be, usually their answer is, let's turn the thermostat down. So in my house, prior to the boiler being changed out, the temperature was running probably in the range of about 63 degrees Fahrenheit. After the change out, we were up around 70. So what happens is I, find, I suddenly changed the dynamic of the heat loss. The 70 degree temperature increased the heat loss out of my building, which all of a sudden started to erode away at my energy savings. So when somebody looks at the, the actual situation, you have to recognize the before and after situation because with the, with the building, energy savings is, is one thing, a comfort is another, and it always becomes a balance. And in my house, once we started to generate energy savings, comfort became a little bit more important, and because of that importance of the comfort, you know, we did erode at some of the savings because of the increased heat loss with that higher temperature. Now, beyond this, she didn't have any any uh, any interest. But one of the things that happens is that also how the control is set up can affect how well I'm losing, how much I'm losing heat of the building. So let's say I go through and I calculate, and I know my boiler going out of the water coming out of the boiler on my design day has to be 160 degrees. The boiler goes in and it ends up set up not for 160, but it gets set up for 180. The higher the water temperature, the lower the efficiency. So all of a sudden, I, this one minor change happens, but because it affects the entire heating season, you know, the green line is always going to stay above the purple line. My boiler runs less efficiently, and also I have a little bit more distribution loss and all everything else that should radiate heat. Up. There's, there's losses that occur that wouldn't be occurring if I ran a little bit lower. This probably is a very common you know, area where somebody doesn't see performance where they, they see that issue. Okay. Now, why does it happen? Let's come back to comfort. On the purple line, the building may be set up that the hottest that building is ever going to be is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Due to comfort, the building occupants may say, you know what, I want the ability to bring it up to 74. The way to get there is I increase the heating curve. Hotter water temperature can result in a higher room temperature under the same conditions. So for the sake of comfort, I sacrifice efficiency. But comfort has to be part of the discussion when you look at the uh, heating systems with homeowners. The other one that I've seen happen a number of times, the time to set the control up and dial it to where it needs to be wasn't in the budget, the quote of the project. So the startup occurs, the heating curve, a default heating curve that everybody knows that there's not going to be any calls about no heat in the building is selected, and we move on to the next job. You know, sometimes that happens as well. But with this, it will, it will sacrifice a little bit of efficiency. The other thing that happens is on the pumping side of things. You know, a retrofit building, I'm probably going to stay limited. I probably want to stay within about a 20 degree drop in the system. Okay? So I look at the pump, hopefully I've selected for it. Again, uh, another, another uh, chart that I pulled out of uh, Lockenbach's press manual, that, you know, it's a real nice uh, efficiency chart. So let's say I'm designed, I'm, I'm in a condition, I expect a 20 degree drop in the system, and I'm supplying 140 degree water. And for the sake of argument, let's say the boiler is at 50% firing rate. So if I go with at 140 and I come back at 120, according to the chart, I should see 90% efficiency out of the boiler. Well, let's say the pump wasn't selected properly. And let's say it's a direct swap out 
and the previous pump was pumping at a higher rate, which is not unusual, and the temperature drops not 20 degrees, it's 10. So all of a sudden, I'm not returning at 120, I'm returning at 130. The efficiency drops two points down to 88%. So I've lost a little bit of efficiency, and the only, you know, the, and it only took the simple act of, you know, the, the selection of the pump to rob a little bit of efficiency out. So when I start to look at this, you know, there's certain things that can happen that will either build or restrict the uh, the the end result of, of the swap out. But from the aspect of what, kind of summarizing everything we talked about, you know, the real reality of um, boiler room conversion is there's a lot of them done successfully, and it doesn't really matter about the, the boiler that's in there. I can drive comfort and I can drive savings. I'm going to throw the words out there again. Do your homework. Know what you're up against. So when you're looking at your price structure, particularly you can talk about what the homeowner is getting versus the competition out there. Now, the other thing from the, from the size of success, and I, from that poll we see it, typically it's more than just a boiler room swap out. Let's build the system so that the, the, build, the boiler can meet the expectation of the building owner, the 20 to 25 years. Okay? And finally, when it comes time to define savings, Make sure it's well primed out in the front. The information is there, and you and there's an explanation of how to figure it out on the back side as well. Well, how the the the, the whole the whole um, carbon monoxide side of things. It's really not tied to the water temperature. It's really about the burner setup. And most of the most of the condensing boilers out there come from the manufacturer with a pre-mixed burner, which is also um, pre-fired by the manufacturer. Um, so it's just a matter on the job site. Again, not really tied to water temperature, but it's on the job site on startup. You know, it's really Take out the combustion analyzer, verify the settings, and then make adjustments as necessary. But I've, I've never seen the water temperature have an effect on on, on carbon monoxide um, production. Um, well, thanks everybody for hanging in there. And uh, hi, John. You encourage some of the, a lot of the people I know on the website. Hi, Max. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.